Today's episode is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash 1P vs 2P. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash 1P vs 2P. Thanks to Audible for supporting our podcast, and thanks to you for supporting us. Microsoft officially endorses cross-network play with competitors, Sony's PlayStation VR pre-orders open up, and Oblivion turns 10. All that plus more today, Tuesday, March 22nd, 2016. You're listening to the 1P vs. 2P podcast. I'm Taylor Ray. With me, as always, is my brother and co-host, Ryan Ray. Let's begin with... We're going to start off on a Sony story. There are sources that Sony is working on a PlayStation 4.5. This is according to a report from Kotaku about a new hardware revision for the PS4. Ryan, why don't you talk about what it means in terms of uh, like graphical upgrades? Right, so this hardware revision is allegedly going to include an upgraded GPU to support high-end 4K resolution for games and also add more processing power that can enhance the game supported by PlayStation VR, which we'll be talking about a little bit because there's also an announcement for that this past week. Uh, in layman's terms, 4K resolution is around four times the p pixel size of 1080p, which is currently what the PS4 is putting out for games. And uh, the current model PS4 can output 4K photos and videos, but it doesn't support 4K resolutions for games. And frankly, they don't have much reason to. 4K TVs are kind of on the higher end of TVs at the moment. And uh, this seems like Sony planning for the future. Yeah, so what does this mean? Like, there are, there are no real reports on when we're supposed to be seeing this out in the market, how much it's going to cost, if it's even truly happening. Of course, when we hear about sources and reports, it could be all fiction. Sony might just be investigating uh, something. Maybe it's even a new console or something completely different. Or maybe it's even an attachment for the PSVR, uh, something that's required to run that thing. So... I'm kind of skeptical. I, I wish Sony, now that this leak has sort of been out, I wish they would come out and either confirm or deny what people are hearing about this 4.5. What, what do you think is going to happen, Ryan? What do you think they're going to say, and what, when are they going to talk about it? You know, it's not unusual for hardware developers and manufacturers to do a revision in the middle of the generation. Um, Nintendo has always done this. Um, Microsoft did it with the Xbox 360 Slim uh, last time around. Sony also did this with the PS3. Uh, this is just a, a very common thing that they do. Uh, I'm, not, I'm surprised that it's expecting so early in the generation. You know, we're really only uh, three or four years in with the PS4 and Xbox One. But remember that those boxes came out and were basically very underpowered right from the start. And I think that the VR headsets that are coming out are kind of accelerating uh, how fast this is happening. Uh, you know, a more powerful PS4 would also let developers um, kind of use more of the console's uh, cores and maybe get some better performance hits. Some versions of games aren't running very well compared to the PC versions of games. Um, the latest example I can think of is uh, Just Cause 3. That game had some real uh, graphics and frame rate issues, both on the Xbox One and the PS4 versions. Um, so by potentially making it more like a high-end current current model PC, uh, they could easily compete with the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive uh, headsets. And you you mentioned Just Cause 3, but I want to throw The Witcher 3's hat into the ring. You know, the console versions, especially on the PS4, uh, don't compare performance-wise with PCs out there. So it seems like Sony, along with Microsoft, are, they're trying to achieve the level of PC performance that we've come to expect lately and uh, people are demanding you know there's uproars about games that that developers keep touting as oh it's going to run at 1080p in a steady 60 frames per second and then sure enough we see the, uh, the the benchmarks after the game is released and of course they don't hold up very well so I'm anxious to see what this is actually going to be and how much this is going to cost us if it's an actual physical hardware upgrade, is it going to be something modular and easy to plug into? Or is this like a complete revision where we're going to have to buy a, a new PS4 to replace this thing to support PSVR? Because if this is all about 
minimum specs to run a PSVR, I'm going to be very, very disappointed. Although, like you mentioned before, we will talk about the PlayStation VR pre-orders opening up, and they haven't made any mention of that at all, so maybe that's that's me just pure speculating here. So I hope it's not required for, for what they're planning with uh, on the VR front. But Ryan, let me ask you this. Why are we so quick to criticize Microsoft when uh, the Xbox head, Phil Spencer, comes out and talks about the Xbox One uh, upgrades. Why were we so critical about his statements and we're talking about Sony's here and not not entirely criticizing their comments? Uh, for one thing, I think uh, you have to take Phil Spencer's comments a little bit differently. Uh, he's been talking about kind of uh, the Xbox One as a uh, like a refrigerator appliance uh, or like an iPhone upgrade model. Uh, Sony, for, for their part, hasn't taken that tact quite yet. Um, to be fair, Microsoft is also plan. Uh, there are there are rumblings of a hardware revision too for the Xbox One, but Microsoft seems very kind of in a confused state about where where exactly their console is, and I don't think Sony is all that confused about where they are. They're <clears throat> at the top of the console pack for now, and I I think I was quick to criticize Microsoft because their PR and messaging is all over the place. Well, well, to be fair, the Sony, I should I should elaborate is that. This is, these are reports. They haven't come out and said anything about this, so I should clarify what I mentioned earlier. Whereas Microsoft, they're actually actively talking to the press about the possibility of like future hardware iterations on the Xbox One and what that might mean for consumers, right? But they're talking about it, but they're, they're not really saying anything specifically. They're, they're just saying it, it may happen, it might happen, but <clears throat> like a lot of other things Microsoft has said might happen, it hasn't really come to pass yet, and we don't have a lot of reason to believe that Microsoft is going to go all the way with this. Uh, you know, they did with the 360 make good on the the promise of making better hard drives, um, making them last less crashy. They definitely made good with the Red Ring of Death situation uh, many years ago, and Microsoft is in kind of a, a rough rough spot right now, and. That's not to say that they won't do cons consumer-friendly moves. That's not to say that they might not do uh, an upgrade path where you might be able to trade in your, your current Xbox One for the, the new model um, for a discount. But right now, they haven't said anything. They just said they're open to the possibility. And until there, there are more specifics, I think we should be on both Microsoft and Sony um, when these rumblings of the hardware revisions come out for them to really... Uh, be be consumer friendly and and try to make it easier for people who have been loyal and been kind of the the first generation of people to buy their consoles, the early adopters. Um, you know, give them a reason to keep their boxes or to upgrade or do whatever you want, but be clear about it. Yeah, well said. And I think personally, on our website, we've kind of stoked the flames of a fanboy flame war with with these kinds of comments because Ryan, we posted your blog piece uh, this past weekend on why you sold your Xbox One, and it's because of the really uneasy future uh, that Microsoft, uh, they don't seem to be behind the console. They don't seem to be supporting it very well. Uh, it's your arguments that like their efforts trying to achieve parity with like the PC are really falling flat in terms of their marketing as well. So uh, with the lack of exclusive games, that, that that was another argument we made in the article. And we got a lot of feedback on Twitter, uh, comments on the blog piece and elsewhere. And this isn't to say, and I just want to put this out there, our show is very platform agnostic. We are not fanboys of any one particular uh, company or platform whatsoever. We play games literally everywhere. And wouldn't you agree to that? Absolutely. I think we're in general uh, fans of video games and uh, I think I think really what we're we're advocating for is games to be good games to be played everywhere and for people to have access to to all this stuff. The harder that these game companies make this for for the players, I think that's that's a bad thing. The more the more confusing DLC um, programs, the more the more complicated season passes get, the all the different ways you can buy consoles and bundles. When you walk into a, a retail store these days, there are about uh, you know four to five configurations for each console. Not to mention every bundle you can get. Not to mention on top of it that there are occasionally uh, seasonal deals on all this stuff. And if you're somebody who's very uninformed and not not keeping up, it's it's very confusing. Uh, even even for somebody who's played video games for a long time, it's it's even confusing for us. 
Um, I think I think as far as uh, console wars, we're not interested in bringing bringing that back up again. That was a thing in the '90s. Uh, it's it's really uh, not cool to to bring all that stuff back up again. But we should hold these game companies accountable and uh, absolutely try to I- encourage them to be in a better place for gamers. Well, let's talk about something. Let's move on to this next story about a better place on all fronts, no matter what platform you're playing on. Microsoft has come out and officially endorsed cross-console multiplayer. So theoretically, and Sony even responded. So, so let's discuss this a little bit. In a statement, Microsoft is saying that people who are on Xbox Live, who are playing on Xbox One, can play not only with people on the PC, but potentially on other competing consoles. So just to give you some context, Microsoft is already supporting cross-platform play between Xbox One and Windows 10 games that are, if you have an active Xbox Live subscription, you will be able to to play cross-play. A good example of this is Rocket League. I believe that was one of the first to do this. And now Microsoft is enabling developers to support cross-network play as well. So this means that if you're playing on Xbox One or Windows 10, you will be able to play uh, not only with other console players, but across PC networks as well. We have yet to see like what the next game will be that supports this kind of move. But let, let's talk about Sony's side as well. Ryan, take it away. Uh, Sony responded to this call uh, later in the week by by with Sony President Shuhei Yoshida saying, um, because the PC is an open flat platform, it's much more straightforward. Uh, connecting two different closed networks is much more complicated, so we have to work with developers and publishers to understand what it is they are trying to accomplish. Uh, Yoshida also said that um, this isn't just a matter of uh, PSN and Xbox Live talking to each other. It's also a technical challenge, and also there's some legal ramifications. Uh, you know, you agree to different terms of service when you sign up for these services. Um, they charge different prices, and uh, it's not just a simple thing of connecting the dots. Uh, Sony, for their part, already has some of this going on with some games uh, more recent, not only with Rocket League, but also the recent uh, Street Fighter V, uh, PS4, and PC players can play with each other um, over the network. But I'm really curious that uh, whether or not this will end up bringing us closer to the one console future we all dream of. You know, competition, I think, historically has been a good thing for games. I think there was a, a lot of reason in the past to kind of support all this stuff. But... Now that that people are, are kind of playing games wherever, and you know, I think a lot of our the games that we buy are driven by where our friends play. The reason we we buy you know PS4 copies of the Division is because that's where most of our friends are playing that that kind of game. If we could play with pe- people who are have Xbox One, I w- I would love that. But frankly, that's not a real possibility right now. And Microsoft is all they're saying is that they're open to the possibility, and that if developers want to support so support it, Microsoft is absolutely behind them. Right. And and just to also clarify, we were also a part of the Xbox Live experience in the last generation, right? I mean, the majority of our games that we played online were Xbox 360 games. You know, they were the winner of the last generation, I would argue, and we followed suit. So this time around, it's a bit of a flip-flop since uh, most of our games that we play online uh, are on PS4 with our, uh, our, our core group of friends. But let's talk about what you alluded to before, which was how Microsoft has sort of supported this kind of concept in the past. Do you remember that really awful Games for Windows Live? I believe it was Shadowrun that was one of those games that was like heavily marketed as play between PC if you're playing on your 360. Like players can play against each other. And that community died so quickly and it was so laggy and the performance was just... Uh, just not up to snuff that it, it turned out to be like a really, really failed experiment, I think, way back when. So they shut down the Games for Windows Live uh, program just only two years ago. But if you were to tell me, name five games that supported that feature, I couldn't tell you. I mean, this kind of thing was like lost to time, especially when people were they weren't interested in this kind of thing. The cross-network thing just never was a concern. But now as we're seeing more and more multiplayer games and communities dying off so quickly in games like early lifespans, I think it's more critical so that like uh, you can still find people to play with even years after a game has been released. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. And the other thing too is that 
Um, the reason why the Shadowrun didn't work out so well was because there are advantages inherent to using a controller versus u using a keyboard and mouse. Shadowrun was a first-person shooter that was kind of very, supposed to be very fast-paced. And uh, if you were using a mouse and keyboard, you definitely had a leg up on people who were using just a controller. Of course, some people would ar may argue that the controller is also an advantage. So there's no real winning for this. And uh, this is kind of a, an old argument back from the old days of Doom and Unreal Tournament. Um, you know, keyboard and mouse players, ask any professional Counter-Strike player what, what they're using, and it more nine times out of ten, it's a keyboard and mouse. So I don't know that this problem is going to be solved uh, anytime soon, but the fact that Microsoft and Sony are, are kind of hedging their bets and saying, well, this could be a possibility, is, a, is kind, would be a huge game changer if it actually did happen, but uh, color me skeptical. Also, if you look back at games like The Orange Box, for example, I remember specifically that when when that was released, it was a great value, right? You could play Team Fortress 2 and you could play that online through Xbox Live. And playing with a controller, you could only play with other 360 players. You could not play against PC players. And if you look at that, I mean, people are still at playing Team Fortress 2 a ton and it's still heavily supported, modded. Uh, that that community is thriving. The 360 version died within like a year to two years. It was you could barely find any games. You could not match make. It was just abysmal. It would have benefited that game specifically it, had there been that cross network play uh, between PC and console players. But the tactical advantage of that mouse and keyboard fidelity versus a controller support it just I, I don't know if that would have been a toxic community in my opinion. I, I, yeah, so it, it's it's definitely a hard thing to to think about especially when you're considering like the the technical things behind that because like let's say one service goes down and the other one's up all of a sudden you know is the the whole service down can nobody play multiplayer uh, w these are the sort of things we have to see from Sony and Microsoft so it, like uh, I want to see this implemented first. I know this is just largely like a PR move, especially for Microsoft. Let, let's stay tuned for that. And this might be a pipe dream, but I really hope this is a thing that's supported in the far future because games like Rocket League, for example, there is no real tactical advantage uh, with playing using a mouse and keyboard versus a controller. That is a game that is a, an excellent example of, of having like a great experience both on the console and, and, and the PC versions for sure. All right, let's move on to something we can be a little bit more optimistic about. Sony announced their PlayStation VR headset, which was uh, unveiled at GDC last week. They're saying that this headset is going to cost about $400 at launch and be out this October. Uh, this bundle is going to include all the necessary cables, the headset, and the processing unit that will be separate from the console box. Not included will be the PlayStation camera, uh, which will be needed to use the headset, adding approximately $60 to the asking price, $460 for uh, that bundle. Uh, Taylor, but they're also offering another bundle if you don't happen to not have a PlayStation camera, right? Right. There's a $500 bundle that they also announced that you can pre-order, which is going to include the PSVR headset, the peripheral PlayStation camera, like you said before, and then also two optional PlayStation Move controllers, the wand and the joystick, uh, the, the handheld controllers, plus a copy of PlayStation Worlds, which is a minigame collection of five VR games. So it seems like a pretty good value. And this comes at the lowest price to date of all VR headsets in the market out there, including also the AR headset by Microsoft, the HoloLens, which is over a thousand dollars for now. So before we started recording, Ryan, you already talked about the pre-orders opening up uh, today, right? On Tuesday. So by the time you hear this, this, this show, these pre-orders are likely to be sold out, right? So you need to plan ahead because they're opening up at 7 a.m. Pacific time on Tuesday this morning. So if you're listening to this, you're already out of luck, right? <laughs> Probably. But the, the thing is, uh, you know, I think a lot of people are going to be pre-ordering this thing. This seems to be kind of the the low ends that we were hoping for from, from PlayStation. You know, I, I would be still very hesitant to to say, uh, go ahead and buy this thing. We don't know the full list of games. We don't know if those games are going to be any good. Um, what what we do know is that the five VR games included 
um, are going to be kind of tech demo. One of them is uh, London the Heist, which has been um, kind of a, a tech demo thing as far back as the PS3, um, as I as I can remember. On top of it, Sony is also saying that their headset is also going to have a theater mode. Any PS4 game that you can play on the console, um, you you will be able to put the screen in your VR headset and uh, have kind of a uh, a better like theater mode experience, more more enveloping. It'll uh, be right in front of you uh, as opposed to a, a TV setup. And uh, that seems to be kind of more more promise than the 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 Vive or the Rift is doing out of the box. Regardless, this is this seems to be the entry point for for VR coming into the future. You know, if you have a PS4, if you don't have a PS4, uh, a new one uh, costs you know three hundred fifty dollars plus the asking price for the the bundle is five hundred dollars. You know that that brings up to your total to eight hundred fifty dollars, which is uh, right around where the Oculus Rift uh, starts. But at, with the Rift and the Vive, you also need a high powered PC with a with a very expensive graphics card. Not to mention you know four USB ports and yada yada yada. In the case of the Vive, you also need a a big room. And which you can put the motion sensors in. With with PSVR, you don't need any of that stuff. And <clears throat> do do we know if if the graphics are going to be good? Do we know if it's going to be lower quality? Absolutely not. We're not going to know until this thing is out in October. But uh, for now, it seems to be the the most promising as far as getting VR into people's homes. Yeah, the thing that we're missing here is the bottom line about VR, which is, are these games worthwhile? Are they good? Are they fun to play? Because once you get over the whole VR gimmick, you're kind of left with the substance of the games. Is it worth the investment? Is it worth these hundreds of dollars where you're just getting a headset and not a dedicated console? Like in the case with the the Vive and the, uh, the Oculus Rift, like you said, you need that high powered PC. Is it going to be worth it to play these things? Like, and that's a huge investment to ask that it's a huge barrier to entry. So it's not for your everyday gamer. I think, uh, you know, I think eventually we'll get to that point where there'll be, we'll get price cuts and they'll be cheap enough and there'll be more competition and, and we'll see games that are like mind blowing that, that you, you must, they're like the killer apps and you must get at least one of these headset. But, but, but I think Sony is doing a great job of pricing this at an affordable price and in, in line with the cost of what a PS4 would be, I think is a very smart move on their part because you can also just enjoy a PS4 without the VR experience, of course. So, so far, no one has reviewed these games. So if the games gain a reputation as being this like amazing immersive experience and most critics are agreeing that they're worth playing, that could really increase the interest of these VR headsets. Like as I see it right now, it's a very expensive gamble. Absolutely, and I and real quickly, I just want to mention uh, the brief article I writ, wrote about the Oculus Rift. That kind of also you can also summarize that those feelings uh, for the PSVR and any other VR headset for now. I think uh, Stephen Totillo, who the editor in chief of Kotaku, also wrote a really great editorial about uh, you know your apathy towards VR is completely understandable. Um, you know, he, basically, uh, quickly, he uh, he just said that if you haven't experienced VR for yourself, you know, it's it's hard to really visualize that. It's hard to really describe these experiences without really going into the headset for yourself. And that's a really hard problem for all these companies making these headsets to solve. And until they get th get these headsets into homes, until they get them into Best Buys, Targets, Walmarts, uh, you know, your everyday gamer is not going to to know whether or not they should plunk down five hundred, six hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred dollars on these headsets, and whether VR is really viable in the future. Well, let's just hope that Sony kind of keeps up support for this thing because if you look at their other moves, like even if you look at the PlayStation Move controllers by themselves, I mean they barely supported them. Uh, look at the iToy, for example, like the the 3D TVs that they even made, and even like something as simple as the Vita, like they've kind of abandoned these things. And these, these things were only put out like a, a couple of years ago. So they have to keep up the support for this peripheral. Otherwise they're going to lose a ton of money. But from what I understand, they've actually come out and said, Shuhei Yoshida actually mentioned that they're making a profit on each of these headsets and headset bundles that are being sold. 
versus something like the Oculus where they're being sold at cost or at a loss. So that is a good market advantage, of course. A lot of times these companies try to put out these products to establish an install base and then sell you on the new peripherals or new software or whatever or subscriptions to their network. In this case, they're making very smart move in, in, in making a profit on each one of these units that are sold. So something important that I wanted to point out as well. All right, enough about the news. Let's move on to new releases for this week. I love new releases. Well, actually, I should back up for a second because this one technically came out last week, but we had a music episode uh, since we skipped our usual show format. So, uh, Pockin Tournament for Wii U. This has gotten a lot of attention lately for being a pretty cool fighting game, and I might check this out. Okay, so... Basically, this is a cross between a Tekken and Pokemon, which has been out in arcades in Japan for a while and was released very limitedly in arcades here in the U.S. But this game features 16 different Pokemon fighters, including Pikachu, Gengar, Blaziken, Machamp, and features even support characters. And the word on the street is that the game's online multiplayer isn't very laggy, so that's very positive news for a multiplayer fighting game because those have been pretty, pretty bad experiences lately. Think Street Fighter V, am I right? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the game looks looks beautiful from what I've seen. I'm kind of unsure about how it plays. It seems to have uh, stances and uh, different kinds of uh, ranges and, and modes that affect the uh, Pokemon's moves and combos. But... Uh, you know, this game also supports land play, which has not been seen on the Wii U. In fact, I think the the last uh, Nintendo uh, game that I remember that supported land play was Mario Kart Double Dash on the Wii, or excuse me, the GameCube. Um, that was a long time ago. So, uh, Pocket Pocket Tournament may be a surprise Wii U hit. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if this started appearing on like the Evo fighting game circuit, like the esports uh, competitive fighting scene. This game seems ripe for that because if you look at like some of the footage from this game, like it's very flashy in this 3D space. It looks like a very technical fighter. I've already seen some charts come out with like top tier and bottom tier, you know, Pokemon characters. And this thing has barely been out. So, so it seems to be gaining quite a following, been getting pretty good reviews. So I, I think it's one that I'm going to be checking out if it gets a, a price cut pretty soon. But knowing Nintendo and their first party games, I doubt it. So I might have to uh, splurge to, to play this game. But I, I'm very curious about it. It looks really, really, really cool. So check it out. Uh, next, we have Salt and Sanctuary out this week for PS4, Vita, PC. Uh, the PS4 version is out this week, but the Vita and PC ones uh, have yet to, to be released. So Ryan, why don't you describe what this is? This seems right up your alley. Absolutely. This is a uh, 2D, uh, for lack of a better term, Dark Souls-style game made by Ska Studios, uh, who, if you remember, were the developers of The Dishwasher and Charlie Murder, both uh, Xbox Live indie indie arcade games. Uh, this game has a very distinctive art style. If you've played the other Ska Studios games, very stylistic, very kind of uh, hand-painted. Dark, violent. Yep. Right. Unlike a lot of games that we describe as Dark Souls likes, uh, this game cribs a lot of its core concepts from Dark Souls mechanics. Um, you know, instead of uh, collecting souls every time you kill an enemy, you collect salt. Um, they have bonfires. They have uh, bosses. They even have the you died screen. Uh, when you kill a boss, it says vanquished. Uh, <laughs> it's cribbing so hard that I'm surprised there isn't a copyright lawsuit uh, impending. And uh, this is part of the first game in uh, a new Sony indie game promotion. Sony has been uh, heavily trotting out their indies. I'm, I, this, it looks very, very cool. I am excited to check it out. Yeah, we, we've seen a lot of these Dark Souls-like games lately, like Bloodborne, for example, that are in the 3D space. But a 2D side-scrolling style game, it, we haven't seen a ton of. Maybe Risk of Rain is something that comes to mind. And, and I believe that has come out on Sony platforms. I may be mistaken, but I, I checked that out on, uh, on PC. So... There, there seems to be a market for these roguelike kind of like really difficult, like super, you know, if you're a masochist and you love being punished by this kind of stuff, like this seems right up your alley, Salt and Sanctuary. Okay, moving on to a game I'm very excited for. I never played this game before, but I'm very excited to check it out this time around. Day of the Tentacle Remastered. It's a cult classic 
by Double Fine Games. This is out on PS4, Vita, PC, well, and it's out today. So this is now, an HD you? remaster the of the classic sequel to Maniac Mansion, which Maniac oh, Mansion is one of my all-time favorite point-and-click adventure games. No I love it. So this one is also point-and-click. This came back out in 1993, so there's a lot of puzzle elements, a lot of time travel, uh, a lot of like really funny and witty like dialogue. And it's so colorful, and it's right up like the double fine uh, sort of legacy of games and style and writing that you're used to from them. And and this is just a touch of remastered, so the the, the visuals have been redrawn, and I believe the voice work has also been re-recorded. So I I I think it will hold up. I, I never played it before, but these point click adventure games are timeless to me. Right, this is from that generation of uh, late LucasArts games. Uh, back in the day, it was uh, LucasArts or Sierra Adventure games. You'd fall on one side of the fence or the other. And I think Day of the Ke Tentacle is one of those games that's really beloved. Hasn't really gotten a lot, a lot of love as far as HD remasters or re-release. So I'm happy to see it come back and excited for a new generation of players to check it out. Uh, so that's Day of the Tentacle Remastered uh, coming out today. All right, also speaking of repackaged games, let's talk about Hyrule Warriors Legends out on the 3DS uh, coming later this week on March 25th. This is a version of last year's Wii U Zelda Cross Dynasty Warriors matchup game. Um, this time, Hyrule Warriors Legends will include all of the DLC packed into it. Uh, some of that, that DLC will be transferable to the Wii U version, but <clears throat> unfortunately, Nintendo has decided to saddle this game with three different season passes, which couldn't be more confusing. Uh, the new DLC, however, does include characters from Wind Waker, which the Wii U version did not have. Um, and also, I will say that this game is currently being advertised as best on new 3DS because if you're playing on an older model 3DS, this game has major performance issues, long load times, and frame rate dips, which, frankly, I don't know why they didn't make it just a new 3DS exclusive if it was going to be that bad on the older model 3ds a ton of people still have that model of, of 3ds but i really liked hyrule warriors on the wii u and i'm very excited to check out this version of the game uh with with more characters and more modes i'm definitely excited to check it out if i'm not mistaken on the older 3ds models you also cannot play it in 3d as well is that right yeah, that's what i've heard it, that's absolutely a shame why even bother Right, I, I'm with you on that. Just make it a new 3DS exclusive. I understand they're trying to to get this out in a, in a bigger market, but if you look at something like Xenoblade Chronicles, for example, I'm sure that sold well. And yeah, yeah, it's disappointing that it's just not the same experience on both. And and but this game, the gameplay wise uh, on Wii U was fantastic. I love it. I'm a huge Dynasty Warriors fan since I don't know, maybe ten years ago is when I played one of the first in the series. And this just does an excellent job of making this accessible with the Zelda universe. So I'm a huge fan. I'm wondering if the handheld version is worth picking up if you've already played the Wii U version. I don't know if all the DLC, which is just playing new characters, it, it is worthwhile. So. Uh, we'll have to, to watch out for the reviews that are out for that. And last but not least, a new release this week is Trackmania Turbo on PS4, Xbox One, and PC. This is that insane consoleized version of the, the PC Trackmania racing style games. Trackmania Turbo looks a little more accessible if you're playing on console. This one is published by Ubisoft. Right, there's not much more to say to that. It has uh, time trial modes, seems to have server lobbies just like the uh, PC versions of Trackmania Stadium and uh, a bunch of the other Trackmania games that were on, on PC that people really got wild. A lot of wild YouTube videos came out of that game and uh, has a really great sense of speed on on this version. And uh, I wonder if, if this uh, version will really... Uh, be picked up by by fans of the series or if they'll stick to the old uh, pc versions which at some point were either free or heavily discounted on steam so uh look for trackmania turbo out today what would you say makes this like a like an insane racing game like i've seen it i know what it is it, it's just utterly ridiculous but what about it makes it so compelling like what why is it such like a wacky like cult little like darling on pc before well, basically, it's the uh, ghost mode of every uh, driving game that you've ever done. It's a, it's a time trial. You're basically in a lobby with 
um, anywhere from 16 to uh, on the PC uh, uh, up to like 60 players per lobby. And uh, you're all trying to compete for the fastest time. And you keep there's like a like a five minute timer, and each each track lasts maybe about 30 seconds for you to do a lap. Some of the longer ones can be can be can go on for a minute or two. And you just try to compete for the fastest lap time. And it's just this this like really fast moving thing. You do loop de loops. Right, they're like they're like Hot Wheels style tracks. You're 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 flipping, you're doing barrel rolls, and you're launching your car. Like it's just utterly ridiculous. Like this is a game that's perfect for streaming or for putting out you know uh, gifts out there on the internet <laughs> to just to show your your Trackmania Turbo gameplay. So uh, definitely worth if you're not going to play this game, just look it up just so you can watch how amazing uh, the, the, this stuff really is. <laughs> it's, it's a very unique unique racing game. All right, enough about new releases. Let's talk about new game announcements. We have a couple this week. Here comes the new challenger. Right, so Plants vs. Zombies Heroes, Lawn of a New Battle, is basically Plants vs. Zombies vs. Hearthstone. This is a mobile game that uh, mimics the, the card battler with uh, Plants vs. Zombies tower defense elements. It appears to be free to play, but will also have the trademark humor and dad joke level puns that Plants vs. Zombies is known for. It's already out in New Zealand and Australia, and it's coming soon to the US and the West. All right, next we have Oddworld Soulstorm, which is coming out next year, 2017. This is a sequel to the last Abe's Odyssey Oddworld game, which picks up the story after the overthrow of Rupture Farms, if you've played that game, and liberating his people. Jim Sterling, that controversial game critic, former Destructoid blogger, he's now doing his own stuff. He's doing some voiceover for this game, so he's starting to get into making games now. Interesting. Also announced this past week, Frozen Synapse 2, a sequel to the turn-based cult classic tactical game, uh, was just announced. This time the game will be open world with the map being procedurally generated, and will also have factions and new and improved AI. A beta is coming later in 2016. Okay, and last but not least, Obsidian announces a brand new RPG called Tyranny after the success of Pillars of Eternity. Obsidian and Paradox are partnering again for another isometric RPG. This game's setting takes place after a world-changing battle of good versus evil with evil winning and the playable characters dealing with the aftermath of that conflict. So goes against your typical action RPG story tropes, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, very interesting premise. Uh, they've had a lot of success with Pillars of Eternity. Uh, isometric RPGs are back, baby. Uh, so <laughs> look forward <laughs> look, look forward to the release of uh, Tyranny coming soon. They haven't been back. They've always been here. <laughs> this Week in Gaming History. This week in gaming history, we have The Elder Scrolls IV, more commonly known to you and me as Oblivion, uh, which came out on the PC and Xbox 360 at the same time on March 20th, 2006. That was just 10 years ago. This is an action RPG sequel to the classic Morrowind. Uh, Oblivion, in my opinion, is really where the series uh, really took off. Uh, this game was developed by Bethesda and 2K, and this game had a really, really incredible open world. Uh, me very memorable graphics, a pretty deep uh, character customization setting, and uh, just just a really, really cool world, really cool characters. Uh, I still hear the music uh, playing in the back of my head uh, occasionally. Taylor, what do you remember of this, this great, great game that probably convinced a lot of people to buy a 360 in the first place? It's one of the best open world games ever, and it was one of those first 360 games that I thought was just like an incredible graphical experience, this really ambitious medieval setting. And as you described, that character customization system was just uh, really, really, really fun in this style of RPG. You could level up skills by using them more often. For example, if you wanted to build up your acrobatics, you could sprint and jump around to so you can gain more stamina, so you can do that for longer without having to rest. So kind of a like a, a unique uh, skill set and like playing in first person in this beautiful environment and even just past the tutorial area where you're escaping this dungeon and then all of a sudden you 
like en end up out into the sun and roaming the countryside was just absolutely incredible. The fast travel system worked surprisingly well, but this game was very worthwhile you just exploring the, the, the vast world that Oblivion uh, had for you. So uh, it also had one of the worst early examples of in-game DLC. Think about that infamous horse armor for purchase. Uh, you could spend real money on something cosmetic. There was a lot of outcry, a lot of memes about this specifically for Oblivion. It was one of those early, early examples of it done uh, very poorly, implemented very poorly, I think, on consoles, on the Xbox Live marketplace early on. Absolutely. Uh, for my money, Oblivion is probably the best Elder Scrolls games. I think it's better than Skyrim, although the sales numbers would probably uh, go against me. I think Skyrim sold a lot more. But Oblivion was just one of those games that you kind of had to be there for, and I think still worth revisiting. It probably has one of the best side quests in all of video games, that Dark Brotherhood dinner party mission. Man, I, I still think about that mission quite a bit uh, when I'm playing um, open world games with side quests. That, that uh, dinner party mission tasks you with killing a lot of the party girls individually, almost as if it was like a Hitman game. And you had to set off a lot of elaborate ruses to get the uh, your targets kind of alone, and uh, then you would kill them. It felt very appropriate to the Dark Brotherhood's Assassin's Guild style. And also, it was, it was just whimsical and fun in this very like serious medieval setting. It was just really, really great. The game also had an expansion called The Shivering Isles, which I didn't really that play that much, but I heard was just this massive, expansive expansion. Taylor, you played The Shivering Isles, didn't you? I did. It was almost like an entirely new world. It was like this, uh, so you entered this realm of like this Daedric Prince of madness, Sheo Gorath, and it was like this like bizarro version of the world that you experienced in Oblivion. And it was it was so cool, very colorful, and like very wacky. I thought it was one of the early examples of great DLC and not that cosmetic horse armor we, we had mentioned before. In, in addition to the Dark Brotherhood, the Thieves Guild quests were, were also very memorable, where you impersonate the Gray Fox so neat, and I think it still holds up, even if you played Skyrim, going back to Oblivion, not to mention the amazing dialogue Enough for a talk. console game, something it's that we you. hadn't really Hi. seen Understand early the in the 360 life cycle. You had not amazing voice somewhere. actors, very it's recognizable so now, like Wes Go Johnson, away, who I've actually fool. met in person, oh, like oh, has that the iconic... Way. Stop, stop right, right there, criminal scum! Like, Nobody he's just an instantly recognizable... Uh, voice in a lot of the future Bethesda games in Fallout and and Skyrim as well. So the the dialogue was was really really something that you wanted to not skip through. You actually wanted to listen in on at every character that you encountered, whether it was on a mainline quest or the incredible amount of side quests available to play. That kind of game holds up, even though it came out. 10 years ago. I cannot believe it. Just talking about it makes me want to check it out again. So happy birthday to The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. All right, let's wrap this thing up. Ryan, you ready for the bonus stage? Yeah, let's do it. Lindsay Lohan's lawsuit alleging the unauthorized use of her likeness in 2013's Grand Theft Auto V survived a motion for dismissal and will move forward. I can't think of a more litigious game than Grand Theft Auto, but honestly, does this really matter? Board and card game designer Eric Lang announced he's working on an official Bloodborne card game. It's based on the game's Chalice Dungeons and has, quote, risk management with a bit of groupthink, inventory management and upgrades, and tactical play in an intense 30-minute card game. If it's anything like the real Bloodborne, I'll die in the first five minutes. Last month marked Pokemon's 20th anniversary, and starting in 1996 when Pokemon Red and Blue launched Japan, the world has purchased millions of Pokemon games and its spin-offs. Over 210 million copies for just the mainline Pokemon games themselves, which is of course the total global sales number. That is a staggering amount of games. I don't even know if any other series comes even close to that. According to a NeoGAF thread, The Witcher 3 is now looking at 251 Game of the Year awards, making it the most awarded game of all time. 
The previous record holder, The Last of Us, ended at 249 total awards. The Witcher 3 not only wins by pure count, it's also winning by Game of the Year percentage because there have been less awards this year than in past ones. So congratulations to CD Projekt Red. That's it. If you liked our show, please subscribe, rate and review us on iTunes and Stitcher. Please let us know what you think of our show. It would be a huge help if you could drop us those reviews. All of our episodes can, of course, be heard on our site, which is 1pvs2p.com. You can also subscribe by searching for our show with your favorite podcast app or by using our site's handy RSS feed. All of our sources for this week's stories have been posted at the link in the show notes. Like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash 1pvs2p, or follow us on Twitter. We're very active at 1pvs2p underscore podcast. We want to thank Benedict Hero, as always, for the use of his songs for our show, Coffee Stomp and Super Manly Brothers X. Both songs are part of the compilation project, Chip Tunes Equals Wood. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you next week. Next week.